Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And on this channel, we do a lot of either primitive build or how-to videos like this one. So if it's first time to the channel, do please consider subscribing. But today I've got something a little extra special for you, and that is we're gonna break down a deer with nothing but stone tools. All right, so what I wanna show you today is typically when we think of working animals with stone age tools that it's super primitive and it's on the ground but it's not hard at all to make a primitive gambrel and hang it from that's all yucca cord that i twisted and i have a phenomenal amount of yucca cord and it's for a whole different project actually it's for my it's my gator hunting cord this part i didn't make um but that's all there that's all yucca corded so we're going to hang it with that and it's a very simple just a stick and super easy for early man to just hang them up on that so that's what we're going to do and then we're going to work through this with stone blades so unlike 99 percent of the animals that i work i actually didn't shoot this one this was donated to us it was uh, a a kind of a law enforcement put down kill and i just happened to be in the area and they needed a place for it to go and i was like yep let's put it to absolute good use because can't bear to see a good deer go to waste so that's what we're gonna do is i'm gonna take a stone knife and i'm gonna work through it with you guys and i actually got my good friend donnie wilkerson here with uh, creek walker trading and so he's gonna help he's pretty much gonna film he might get in here and help a little bit too but uh yeah, I got one of the stone knives from the bison skinning video, actually, if you recognize that one. And uh, I'll drop a link down to that video in the description as well. If you haven't seen it, you should. We break down an entire bison with nothing but Stone Age tools and technology. But we're here actually at my house. We're just going to hang this up in the backyard. So you're probably going to hear stuff like cars go by or kids yelling or, or uh, even my wife right now is packing about 70 books of the new secrets and science of primitive archery books that we've got we just got a whole new shipment in today and so she's up there you probably hear her ripping tape the whole entire time that's what that noise is <laughs> so we're all hard at work so anyway let's kind of get into it and we'll break this thing down you pull and i'll uh you lift and i'll pull a little bit more Ready? Good to get started? Just a tiny bit more? Yeah, let's go a tiny bit more. That'll work. Yeah, so remember, just because it's primitive doesn't mean you have to do it on the ground, you have to do it hard, okay? So just like anything else, early people's figured out how to do things a little bit easier and it uh, doesn't take anything to do it and saves a ton of time and a, a lot of bending over. We got a fresh sharpen on that, on that knife. Like I said you probably saw it in the bison video and in the uh the, one of the hog hunt videos whoops <laughs> that just slid a little bit i think the wind blew <laughs> i think it's moving down the tree yeah it probably wind. yep probably be all right we'll move it again in a little bit so i got a fresh sharpen on that knife and like i show in the other videos as you're kind of splitting stuff out come from the the uh the skin side in this way to cut instead of through the hair because the hair is what depletes the edge you know what i mean so it's good and sharp and i'm going to actually be a little bit careful because deer skins i like to save deer skins like hog skins are kind of a dime a dozen but the deer skins i like to keep especially these uh these thin florida hides there's not a lot of fat and they're a, a thin skin and they're really good for stuff like handle wraps and any sort of little projects where a thin skin is a little bit nicer so we're going to keep this one nice and we'll set it aside and we'll tan it later actually i probably won't tan it i'll probably make donnie tan it <laughs> oops talking to me mm -hmm. <laughs> i heard that yeah so it's pretty much like any sort of uh breakdown on an animal going to do the same things that you do with a steel knife you're just going to use a stone knife and it's got a different feel to it you know it's a little bit more of a jagged edge but if you get out of control you can definitely uh, bust through the hide so we're not going to be in a rush just going to work it down yeah that's the best part having an extra set of hands to either hold it or you could just tie it off actually to another another tree 
probably looking in there to see the kids pirate ship in the background I built for him. <laughs> So the reason that you really want to to hang them up, you know, like a bison is you know a little more difficult to hang up. But uh, if you got a deer and you can hang it up, there's no reason you shouldn't because you're going to keep all the leaf litter and dirt and everything else out of it. So I know it's it's uh, sometimes seems like it's more romantic the idea that well if it's really primitive, you're supposed to do it on the ground and you're supposed to suffer. But it doesn't take but. 15 or 20 minutes to put something like this together and then once you twist all that yucca cord not only is it good for this but it's good for so many other things so i mean i've had that now for quite a while it's not the same stuff that i did the first gator with uh but we've got you know potentially another gator hunt coming in the future that we might use that on and uh it's just nice to have a good length of yucca rope and it's plenty strong so we use it for all kinds of different purposes. Actually, the more you use it, it keeps it flexible, keeps it from uh, drying out too much and breaking. If you just make it and set it there, it doesn't last forever. But all that hair, I'm not super crazy about, but because it's it's not deer season right now, it's actually blowing its winter coat. You can grab a hold of this thing, kind of like a dog and pull hair out of it it's blowing its winter coat because it's when is this i don't even know it's march. mid mid march yeah late march so this was a last year's fawn and it was a like a humane put down from the game commission and so of course they don't want to they don't want to throw them in a ditch and get rid of them easier so they donate them to people that'll eat them and use them so i've kind of just had them on the list that if they ever get one that they're like really close here to my place to give me a call and so they showed up today and dropped one off and that was that was pretty awesome at least it doesn't go to waste you know because we're going to eat it without a doubt but it was last year's fawn so there's no so it's dry there was no other fawns to go with it that's kind of i mean it's a florida deer so they're not huge anyway but that's the reason it's probably what i think what it's 70 pounds 80 pounds at best probably 70. not a huge deer but it'll still eat really good especially because it's young we can get a lot of good resources get these legs knocked down and we'll uh lift her up a little bit higher But that hide's gonna be just about perfect for handle wraps, and I really need some brain tan. And Donnie promised me that he was gonna take it home and he was gonna tan it for me. <laughs> Bring it back, right? <clears throat> right. Isn't that what you said? Right. <laughs> yeah. These are easier to tan because they're thinner and yeah. they're, they're not as tough. As soon as he saw it, he was like, Yeah, I'm gonna take that home and I'm gonna tan it for you. <laughs> That's a, immediately what I thought. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you guys, uh, you probably haven't seen Donnie for a, a little while, but we've been friends for a, a long time. He's in, the, he's in my, new, my new book. He came and helped me out with a lot of the projects and the tests that we did with it. And, uh, and he's, he owns uh, Creek Walker Trading, and he makes the bow quivers, if you have seen those before, which I know we don't typically use a lot of bow quivers in the, the primitive archery side of things, but... Some of my first videos where we're using the bow quivers he's the one that makes those so he runs that business and we tend to go on adventures and he's actually working on building a, some a new kind of a bow line for entry level primitive archery which i haven't even like discussed that with anybody yet but there's a kind of that's kind of coming and he's helping me work on that so that's who he is but you should check him out. I'll drop a, either a card on the screen or a link down in the description of where, where you can find him and the quivers that he makes and that kind of stuff. But we've been friends for, what, now over 10 years since I've yeah, been back Since you've been back from Montana. Yep. Since Donnie was one, maybe. Yep. Since, and we've, since like, little Donnie. All the, like the old original videos, like you saw the, 
um, some of the ones that have done really, really well, like the bushcraft hog hunt and the, the, um, might've been that one. I don't know. Like throwing atlatls into snakes and stuff like that. Those really early videos. Donnie was the one that was with me there, but he typically runs around and films because he knows I'm just going to run and do stuff. So he'll just grab a camera and be like, yeah, let me, I'll just do that. <laughs> So he's typically behind the camera more than he's in front of it. Alright, we can probably raise it up now, what do you think? Yeah, we can try. Yep. Then I'll show. Instead of working my stone knife, I can definitely saw through that, but I want to preserve the edge. So I'll kind of find that joint, one of those joints a little bit. There you go. See how easy it was? You just kind of work through slow. <laughs> See how many people just sit there and wail on that with a knife. Like, yeah, let's not do that. So we're not exactly sure what the deal was with the deer, but you can see its skin, all like those capillaries. I know that that's stress when it's put on it. I don't think it's disease. If I had to take a guess, and I don't really know, I think it was hit with a car because it was found in a yard. It was in like in somebody's yard or just in the bushes off of it and it couldn't get up it just laid around so it was under stress i don't think it's any sort of disease we're going to open it up and look in the uh look at like the liver and stuff anyway look for for lesions inside the chest cavity i think we're good to go we don't have a chronic waste disease down here in florida never a single uh reported case especially this far south florida but she's got a little bit of discoloration in here it smells fine but you can tell that there's some stress going on but it's always good to, especially if you're going to work at bare hands, kind of like I do or whatever, you know, wash your hands until you kind of get an idea of how you feel. Most people like should be wearing rubber gloves. I've been doing this my whole life. So, I mean, if, I, if I'm going to get something now, I, I, I would have had it my, you know, at some point. But anyway, we'll open her up. We'll hit, take the skin off. But that, that shows me right there that that's some sort of internal um trauma to organs and the fact that she's a little bit green in here so definitely doesn't smell bad doesn't smell foul and it's a fresh kill because she was alive but you know that's probably what that's all about right there is i would assume she's probably been kind of tapped probably wasn't like a full cream with a car probably ran across they slammed on the brakes and one good little hit knocked her down she ran off and probably went a good ways and you know just couldn't recover from organ damage i'm assuming i don't know Look at the size of that that poor girl right there on her mm. on her tit. She's got that huge tick on her. I can't imagine how uncomfortable that would be. We're gonna make make sure that thing goes away because I don't want I don't want that around anywhere. Donnie said he's gonna eat it. Yeah. We'll set it aside. Yeah. <laughs> if you fry it. Yeah. That's, I don't see any more on it. There's a no big ticks, but there's all these little those little deer ones. ticks. Yeah. 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 I don't even know what the, they're not like a regular tick. I only get them on a deer. It looks like. Is that ticks or fleas? They're the what they call the deer ticks. I think are deer fleas. Yeah, it's they not like, like they were moving fast for ticks. Yeah, they're not a normal type of tick. Yeah. It's a good sharp stone knife, though, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> when it's not gummed up, going through that junk right there, that's not gonna that's gonna slow us down a little bit. I need an extra hand, and you're. Perfect. Okay. She said worse than a dog. What's that? She said it's worse than a dog. Yeah. I guess even grab that side. We'll just, it's a little easier with two hands. Put a little tension on it. Two people job. Makes everything just a little bit easier, doesn't it? Be careful, I'll take some fingers with it. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> I'm a wild Not much man. to grab a hold of there. Yeah, he's blowing that coat out. Yep, yep. One, one, one or two more. 
I think I got cut on your finger now. <laughs> or your ring, one of the two. There we go. Yep. That's spin nice. That's a hairy mess right there. Holy <laughs> yes, smokes. What the heck's going on around here? Yep, it's, hate to see a deer go the way that this one did, but at least we could put it to good use. Oh yeah, she was hit. Absolutely, she was hit. Look at that. Yep. That's that's what happened. She was hit. Well, it makes me kind of feel good though. It wasn't disease of some mm -hmm. sort. Yep. That's a hundred percent. If you ask me, that's blood. That's all yep. bruised out. Yep. Does that make sense to you? Yep. Definitely. That's a shame, but at least she's going to eat really good being last year's fawn. Should be good. So what we're going to do too is we're going to save the legs off her. And I'm going to tell you why, because there's a lot of sinew that's going to run up in here. And deer leg sinew is so much longer than about anything else because of these big long legs. So we'll, we'll run it right down to the knee knuckle and debone the meat off. And then I'm going to save the, uh, the legs on her because in another video, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and knock the legs out and save the sinew and, and uh, save the leg bones and all that kind of stuff. And, Really, what I what I typically do is I just let Mother Nature save the leg bones for us. So we just throw them out, throw the carcass out, and let them let the bugs get, eat. Yeah, exactly. All the meat off of it. And, and it's kind of uh, you know every now and then you know something will wander off with one, and then that kind of stinks. But between these and you know we just find deer in the woods all the time too. So we just throw them in like a normal spot, as opposed to trying to just clean them all off by hand. Nature does that best, without a doubt. Yeah, see, there's no trauma on that side. Yep. Very little. I mean, you can see it's a little, but nowhere near, no, no, nowhere near no. like that side. She was bumped. Yep, hit with a car right there. And probably did something, damage to some organs. Yep. That's it, she went septic. So hopefully she didn't have to suffer too long. And now I feel a lot better knowing that she's not, <laughs> yeah. not got something funky going on. <clears throat> Let me hold it. Oh, you're fine. Do that. And stone knives are a little sharper than folks give credit for. I mean, I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of stone knives over the years that that really aren't sharp. So that's one of those tough things. If somebody looks into stone knives and like it doesn't feel very sharp it's typically it's one that's made for show so they get a bad name you know if you go to a show and the edges are kind of abraded and pressure flaked but not actually sharpened then stone knives can really get a bad name but when they're sharpened up you know kind of like we do the stone points they're they're pretty darn sharp i don't want to get hit with one they'll they'll rip you up What? Well, y'all did a whole bison and never had to resharpen. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they needed so. sharpen at the end of the bison. I'll tell you that. But yeah, we didn't have to. I mean, you've already basically skipped this deer, and it's still, still very sharp. Oh yeah, yeah. What do you think the time difference is, Donnie, between working one with a steel knife and a stone knife? Maybe not a lot maybe 20 percent longer with a stone knife yeah maybe it's not it's not a it's lot. not it's not much longer joe pointed that out when we were doing the bison too he was like i'm really you know kind of surprised and he's worked with a lot of that stuff but he's not done like a bison he's like it's just about as fast mm -hmm. i'm trying not to cut myself right now you got it gummed up too yeah i, I believe oh, the whole th yeah whole thing's a dang mess right now 
cut that artery. Yep. So we're over there in the corner working on the on the deer. Kelly's been up here ripping tape. I said so of course the lighting's all messed up. So she's up here in the barn just trying to get every book she can packed up to mail out. But uh yes, it's just kind of home life. This is the messy work barn is what it is here. I know people have seen the tractor before and everything's just blown apart, but uh yeah, so we're definitely uh right in here working on it and she's i don't know what 60 70 books going out today so <clears throat> nice to see that but just a good day overall i guess we're gonna get back to the deer Lift it up a little bit more but we'll be all right we can do it ah we'll be all right fine. all right so now like the shoulders well you know even before we do that let's let's knock legs off so just start finding where joints come together just carefully there's no sense hossing through it just kind of back and forth cut it and then find you're just cutting those ligaments is what you're doing as soon as you start kind of hitting the bone you want to back off just a little bit but just cut the ligaments and we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna save these legs and then we'll do this another day. I got a bunch of other work to do. So, you know, if, if we'd had absolutely nothing else to do, I would just sit down and do them all. I'm just gonna throw these legs in the freezer and we'll pop them out today and we'll skin them out and take the sinew out and all that kind of stuff. But as soon as you pop those ligaments, that, uh, that joint will come loose. You just don't want to be sawing like this when you hit bone. That's, I mean, you can saw through bone with them. You're just going to deplete your edge and you just need to sharpen. So it's just being careful. I'm gummed up pretty good here, but. Mm -hmm. That's like with a steel knife, you end up just kind of hossing through it all because you're not that worried. The main difference is it doesn't gum up. That's right, yeah because it doesn't have serrations for the most part. Yeah, but the serrations is what really makes it sharp because it's in between those serrations that is the sharpest point. But that's it. See, like, you'll pop right in between a joint when you hit one. And if you go slow and don't try to force through it, all you got to do is follow the ligaments and cut them. And as soon as you cut those ligaments, that joint will just pop right apart. It just takes a little bit of practice to figure out where they are. I remember the first times, you know, even even running a steel knife, the first time it ever came to knocking legs off, it was it almost seemed like it, it was an impossible job because it's like where exactly is the joint? It gets confusing because it looks like the joint's here and it's actually up a little bit higher. But all you, best thing you can do is actually watch how the leg bends, say where does it move, and that's where you focus your attention with cutting. And as soon as you feel it hit that bone just a tiny bit, you just back off. Cut the ligaments all the way around. And one pop. About like that. Spin it up. That's where we get eggs restricted, right there. <laughs> and we cut that sinew. So that all that sinew is going to be in there. And we'll clean this up. Like I said, we're going to take it out. We'll do that in a different video. Normally, I bone the meat off the shoulder first. Um, in this case, I, I'm probably not going to. I'll take the whole shoulder off, and then I'll bone that meat off afterwards. Since she's kind of small, it's not a big deal. I'd rather just kind of get her in the cooler quick because it's starting to kind of warm up a little bit. So we're just going to knock the whole shoulder off, and then the rest of her we're going to bone out. But uh, as far as boning the shoulders off, they just they disconnect really, really easily. There's actually no bones that hold them in there. It's just uh, ligament and cartilage and stuff like that. So just follow that shoulder blade around. That right there, when people say they don't know what that cartilage pad is that I've talked about in the past, that's what I've talked about. And it's like, I didn't know anything about that. It's not real big, but that's one of those things where it's like hitting a trampoline. And the shoulder blade's under it, but right around the outside is a piece of cartilage. And people that shoot something in the shoulder, but don't, you see what that is right there? 
that's exactly what I'm talking about. And that's probably a good thing to show. That acts like a trampoline when you hit it, and it's like a, I'm pretty sure it's cartilage. But it extends out pretty far, and it's hard to actually cram a stone point through that. And there's not a lot to it, but it's not on the shoulder blade itself. But that's what that is, if you ever read that in my book where I talk about that. That's one of those unfortunate hits. But that there's a piece of meat under here that everybody misses. So I always cut that one close because it's not a ton of meat, but if you're, you know, get on a bigger deer, it's a decent piece. But I leave it either connected to the shoulder or I'll go ahead, go ahead and take it off separately. But I cut right up close to the uh, rib cage. So that cartilage will stop. <clears throat> It'll stop the penetration. Yeah, because it bounces. So like if you're now if you're shooting from the ground, it's not a big deal because you're aimed down here. Yeah. But a lot of times when this thing's up here, see how far back it went? And people will hit like right here and it'll miss the shoulder blade, but it'll hit this thing. And I've seen that where I've shot deer before and actually found like either scars on the shoulder or in this part. And it has so much bounce to it that it'll stop the arrow from going through. So if you're in a tree stand and you're shooting down, you can see how far we back when we came. It's here. If you hit that, it'll you'll people will be like, oh, I got this much penetration. It's like it, I hit it high on the shoulder. That's where you hit. You either hit the shoulder blade or you hit that thin ring of uh, of cartilage. And it's not a it's not a big target, but it can get in the way at most inopportune times. And you shoot right through it with a steel point, but with a stone point, it's a little bit different. So when I walk this down, same thing here, you're kind of separating these muscle groups because all this stuff, that's still good meat in there. We'll grind that for burger or, you know, anything. I don't. I try not to waste a whole lot. I mean, stuff gets wasted, you know, it's just the way it works. But all that extra meat right there, I mean, look at that. Most of that gets cut off and left on the carcass. And there's, you know, a quarter pound of meat there. So you got half a pound with both sides and that's on a small deer. But that's right down to the ribs. Now the ribs, I like saving ribs, ribs typically. On larger deer, you'd be good to go. On this one, not only is she beat up because she was hit with a car, so we're not gonna save the ribs on her. But on a small deer, man, they, sh they shrink up bad, really bad. But you see how clean that comes off if you actually cut tight to that shoulder? And even like this, this uh, brisket meat here, that's the same, kind of the same deal. You can trim that and if you just clean it up a little bit all that little extra burger meat that you get and if you got a grinder but that's also the type of stuff if you were doing it completely primitive you would slice this with uh, a stone knife and I mean that's just prime jerky right there and also one thing see all the hair on it if you let it kind of I don't know what you want to call this it like yeah, it gets a it, film on it. Film it on it, and then you can just rub it, and most yep. of your hair is going to come off of it then. Mm -hmm. Wow, once it dries. Yeah, so when you're trying to take a shoulder off, try to make it look like that, where you don't, you don't cut through this different membrane. You'll end up getting it pretty darn clean when you do that. So same thing. I want to take some. Of, I always go a little bit wide. You went inside. No, I didn't. Huh. No, see that's where that cartilage pad is? Yeah. Okay. Right there. Yep. But that's why if I do cut it off the bone, or if I cut the whole shoulder off, that's why I try to go in mm -hmm. pretty far. And then that, hit that piece of meat. Cut that off separate or all at once, whatever you want to do. But yeah, the ribs on this one, as much as I do enjoy the ribs on a bigger one, these little ones, we've, we've spent the time and cut them out and done them. And then it's like, uh, yeah, thanks for the three bites of meat. It's not even worth trying to cut the meat out in between them. You can see how little it is. There's just unfortunately nothing there. Perfect. Right there. Just like that. Alright, now, 
So what we kind of what we decided about we talked about it off off camera is because she was bruised up and hit really hard the inner tenderloins on one this size is going to be about like a hot dog on each side and as much as i love them and i can are but i can already see the stress and the the color it doesn't smell bad so it's fine to eat but i think because she's already gone septic that's why she was dying we're going to go ahead and just leave those alone um and we'll go it's we're just losing a hot dog on either side and unfortunately it's a great piece of meat but <laughs> it's kind of not worth opening her up to do it at this point so we're just gonna not even gut her do the gutless method on it pull the back straps and the hams and the shoulders and, and run with it so I start up here I don't take all of this with the back strap but while I keep a line going I'm gonna run right up along start at the tailbone and I want to keep tight to the rib cage as tight as I can Try to keep off the bone as much as possible, but Not perfect right there. And the reason I start so high anyway is because you're gonna end up cutting it off from the ham when you're there anyway, so you might as well run it on a straight line. And somebody else might do it different and uh, actual professional butcher would probably say I'm doing it wrong and that's that's fine too it doesn't matter to me how you do it it's just how I do it and then I will run down into the neck even though there's you can see how much how little meat there really is but that's why I don't skin the neck down terribly far because we're down to where the, I mean there's nothing here it's just run out so I'm gonna run that right down to the bone until I start clicking bone with the tip of my knife and that's why I don't use here I use the tip of my knife because I'd rather it be a little bit dull start clicking that bone a little bit and then right here where the muscle group separates and right to the hip I'm gonna cut that over okay and then kind of dig the knife in a little bit and get up under it I'm gonna walk that down just like that a little bit sticks out there that's a nice piece of meat even on a even on a little deer that's a nice piece of meat yep it's actually bigger than i thought it was gonna be yeah me too i thought she was gonna be a little smaller <laughs> i did see hogs don't have hardly anything <clears throat> you gotta have a fat hog to have a good loin you really do but these deer even a small deer has got a nice piece of meat here and right where the rib cage is the same thing we're gonna just follow that rib cage up and that's a muscle group you can see them the muscle group right there and then the sinew when people ask where the sinew is that's what all this is and it runs up under here a little ways too you can see it run out right there so whenever we actually clean this meat and i have a different video on cleaning the sinew and if i remember to i'll drop a link down in the description where you can watch that where we pull that out but that sinew runs from here all the way up you can see it so i leave it on the back strap and then when i process the back strap out that's when i remove the sinew and then i dry it and then that's what we use to you know make bowstrings and on one this size i would prefer not to make a bowstring just because it is a little bit thinner and, and more weak but you can you absolutely can you just have to use a little bit more of it it takes a couple more deer this size um but it's absolutely perfect for haft and arrowheads and knife blades i mean that's what that's wrapped with right there is sinew and that's if this pine pitch glue breaks which it's not going to break on a deer when we did the bison we broke some loose it helps hold the blade in you can actually continue to still use it just to finish the job but that sinew is so valuable i actually wrote about how valuable it is in in the book that i've talked about i'm sure a lot of you heard about that you know the secrets and science of primitive archery so right there that's a that's a heck of a piece of meat right there perfect even on a little deer just carry that conversation on however yeah, yeah the one that you shot like yeah, I said the most one, people they the stones the stone point when i shot up in georgia we <clears throat> we didn't find it till about 11 so by the time we got back to camp 
and started scanning it. It was about one o'clock in the morning and we started with a stone knife, but uh, just to see how it worked, it worked perfect, but uh, we were rushed for time because we needed to get to bed. So we were getting, getting up at five to go back hunting. But that's what most people do though, is they, they start and they tinker with it, but, and say, okay, it works, but don't finish it. Like that's a story we hear all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we didn't finish it with the, the stone blade. <clears throat> but it worked perfect. We didn't have any issues with it. It was just a little quicker to go just to grab our pocket knives. We were more used to the pocket knives for one thing. Yeah. And which is, you know, yeah, I guess you got to figure that too, that I've done enough now with this stuff that it's kind of second nature at this point. And most people don't. So that's, I think that's like entry level where people say, okay, well, I'm going to do one with stone knives. And then they get a start on it and they do a little bit. And then they kind of abandon it, yeah, because they think they can go a little bit faster. But it's yeah. really not that much faster. And once you, no. once you really learn how to do it, yeah, there's no reason really not to do it. So I'm gonna cut around the hip bones here on one. Try to get it about as close as I can, but I'm not gonna go crazy. I'm just kind of curving that in a little bit. Okay, so just in, kind of try to cut close to the bone. You're always gonna leave a little bit on there, and you could. If you really, really, really needed the meat, obviously what you'd do is disarticulate all of these bones and you just boil the bones out, you know, get all the meat and everything off of them. So with that skin on it, you can see how it starts to dry really fast. That's good for keeping bugs off. That's why we're not hit with flies and everything right now. But you can also see the muscle groups. So when it comes to knocking the meat off, you can just hog at it any which way you want. But what I try to do is I start following those. See how that sinew line is? Because that's a little bit better. If you isolate that, you can peel it off a little bit better later. So I follow that down and I just separate the muscle groups. So instead of cutting through the muscle groups, kind of like I did right there, what I really want to do is I want to follow the muscle group because that membrane separates so easy. You can see it. It's just all it was was membrane holding that together. I didn't have to cut through any meat and then walk that up. You gotta be a little bit careful you start getting around some of these uh, tendons because if you knock that tendon off, we're gonna save that later because that right there is good tendon to use for stuff, but we don't wanna get crazy and then cut through it. But that's what I was saying, all that stuff in the, in the, the thighs and stuff, if you don't cut through all that when you're processing the meat, you can save a lot of that stuff. It's still good sinew. So follow that muscle group to wherever the next one kind of is. And see how it just peeled right out of there. Didn't even have to cut through any, just a little bit. That was just right around the butt. But all the rest of that, now it's just one solid piece of meat. And there's sinew in there too, right there. That's a whole strip. It's like a mini back strap sinew, basically. It runs up through the thigh. But you can use all that. Now, it's not good for a bowstring because it's too short, but that's perfect for wrapping fletchings and stuff like that. So it doesn't matter which direction you go from now, but I'll come up here the same way. Follow the next muscle group. Cut around that sinew. If you cut a little bit of it, it's not the end of the world. Break that loose and then we'll flip this side. And that's a good piece of meat right there. So I might need to spread that out just a little bit so I can get in there to work. Perfect.
just trying to follow the muscle groups. Like I said, you can hog it off if you want to and cut right through the muscle groups. That's what we normally do with a steel knife. But good, great piece of meat right there. And then that's, I don't know what, what they call that, like a top round steak. So it's kind of round and you cut them like this with a steel knife. God, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know any, I don't know any of my cut. I just cut it all up and eat it. <laughs> I'm not sure either. I'm just kind of trying to throw in guesses out there. I'm still not real sure where pork chops come from. <laughs> And then like that calf, especially on a deer, if you got a serious grinder, you can knock that apart. But I, and everybody can say what they want. You can throw it in a crock pot if you want to. There is so much sinew in there. I'm not gonna mess with it. What I'm gonna do is when I take this leg off, I don't care about the meat in here. You're gonna get about three tablespoons worth of meat. All that is, is sinew. And you'll see in a future video, we're gonna split this out down to here and then take and rake all the meat off and there's gonna be about this much meat and that's all gonna be sinew packed in there. So people are like, well, I'm gonna crock pot that or whatever. You can have that for a crock pot if you want to. I don't want, I don't care about that. Well, what I want, I want sinew. So if you cut it off here, now your piece of sinew is only this long. If you split this out, now you've got, these things feather out like fingers throughout this thing. And even if you don't wanna wrap or like pound it out and make lashing sinew to wrap stuff if you clean all that out you can boil that down into glue and you can make you know animal glue or sinew glue or hide glue essentially it's the same stuff that's what i would prefer to save it for is boiling down into glue i don't give a hoot about eating the three tablespoons of meat that are in there well, i got enough meat on this thing in other places but if you want to put it in a crock pot and eat a bunch of sinew, I'm I'm all for it if that's what you want to do. But like, look at that piece of sinew right there. We'll leave that attached to it because that's a good piece of binding sinew right there. So much of that gets either run through a grinder or thrown in the garbage. And at the very least, cut it off and use it for glue. But I try to get as close to the bone as reasonably possible. You see there's another piece of sinew here, so I kind of don't want to cut that. I'll cut it up close to the joint. I'll leave it in here. another strip of sinew see that right there so <clears throat> if you get to that muscle. yep if you get to that without cutting it get up under it like this and then cut it up it'll run out right there at the, right at that joint you see that go ahead and cut that off because all this stuff you're gonna take this off anyway when you clean your meat don't worry about saving it for lashing if you want to throw it away throw it away I don't care what you do with it but that's the kind of stuff that when I clean this stuff off later, all these bits, that's what I save to make glue out of. I don't care about rendering down a hide to make glue. I would much rather take sinew and, rough and render that down. We'll make sure we've got a video on that here in the near future too. I've been working on some pottery for that. So last kind of little bit here. Got it pretty thin. And like I said, if you're really in a serious primitive situation what you're going to want to do is disarticulate all of these bones and you're going to boil all of this the whole you know pelvic girdle and the whole nine yards you'll you'll work all of that out okay here's kind of a fun part we're right onto that inner tenderloin right there you see i said i wasn't going to go get it but i am so i'm gonna put my knife down on my moccasin and i'm gonna run my finger because you can separate it with your finger and I'm gonna pull that little hot dog worth of meat out without ever having to gut this thing. Yeah, cause it's a little stinky in there. You smell it? Mm -mm, not yet. Yeah, I do a little bit. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's not on the meat, but <clears throat> the last, that's the inner tender one right there. Yep. So we didn't even have to you gut it. You can tell how, how soft it is. Yeah, there's not much, but there's one little spot that it kind of connects right there. 
once we cut it it's out so I've got the inner tenderloin stuck to that last piece of ham that we did so save that what I'll do is I'll cut that off when I put it in the cooler and then we didn't even have to gut it and get into that because like I said I'm not saving organs on this one because it's been it's been hit so you know folks like the heart and the heart's probably fine but the organs are the first thing to get tainted and if it's been laying septic for that long I, I probably just kind of want to skip it honestly so you could start up here too this is what I do usually do with a steel knife is I start right at that knee and kind of cut I think that's called the sirloin I'm not positive about that either kind of fun somebody will come on and correct me and be like nope you're totally wrong <clears throat> but yep just separating muscle groups So this one, we'll try not to walk through it a little bit. We'll just kind of knock it off pretty quick without explaining through it, because we're almost done. Yep, so you can see I haven't had to, I'm hitting a little bit of bone here and there, but I haven't had to stop and sharpen the knife. Now, by the time it's, we're about all said and done with this, it wouldn't hurt to give it a little bit of a freshen up. And so just to sharpen these knives, I do have a video on that, things you need to know. All you're going to do is you're going to take a flaker and you're going to take, you don't even have to do it on both sides. You just take some of the high spots and you just kind of click with a flaker down and it's going to expose new fresh stone and so you just take a pressure flaker whether it's antler or even modern copper or whatever and you just take some of these high spots and you pop 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 and it's going to expose a new fresh edge so we're getting a little bit dull but if i bear down on it i can certainly cut through myself because i'm cutting through this still you don't want to have to push like ridiculously hard but you start getting down towards the end after you've nicked enough bone it will dull up a little bit but not bad. I mean, it's still doing the job just fine. And realistically, you could do a few deer without ever having to sharpen one if you really wanted to. Thank you. Get that last little piece right there. I won't get you. <laughs> I almost promise. <laughs> you can say I won't get you, but you know. The end result might be different. Won't be the first time. That's right. If yeah, because we're not going to save the ribs on this one, I do have that. Jason talked about uh, how to cut the ribs out of one where you score it and you pop them back. Since we're not going to do it on this one, on that bison video that I definitely dropped a link down in the description where we busted up the whole bison, he talks about that, where you split the ribs and you can bend them backwards mm -hmm. and take them out with nothing but a stone knife. Did he score them on the outside or on the inside? On the inside. So yeah. you split, up, split yeah. up the rib meat until you get to here. And then you just kind of, you, you break it off to here, yeah. which isn't that hard. Yep. And then break them back. And as soon as you kind of break that joint, then you just score, rah, 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 and then it'll pop. Like you just kind mm -hmm. of wiggle them and pull a little bit and they'll pop right off. Let's see if I can get that. Oh, I missed the loin on that one. I'll have to go back and get it. It's right there. It's hanging on. Yep, I just cut through it on that, or cut through the edge on accident. piece there. Ain't gonna waste that one. Right there. Yep. See it? Yep. That's how it is. So that's what you're looking for guys. You don't have to you don't have to completely gut it. You just get up underneath that hip. See how perfect that piece of meat is. And that one's that one's worth getting out if it's mm -hmm. not tainted. Yeah. If it's laid overnight gut shot, 
sometimes it's so it's it's pretty pretty rough but you can typically separate it with your fingers just don't want to tear the crap out of it there you go just like that piece of sitting yeah you can usually just push your fingers right along the inside and separate it from the rib cage on the opposite side and then get down into the bottom not even sure what I'm cutting at this point I'm just trying to get it there we got it <laughs> see and there you go eh, a little bit bigger than what two hot dogs I guess yeah so good way to get them out without having to actually open the belly up not a lot of meat but it's good meat and there's that last muscle group here break that one out because we're gonna come up right to Donnie's hand <laughs> <laughs> I got my finger. <laughs> Making fun of getting you. Oh, no, you better watch, better watch yourself. Mm -hmm. One muscle group. Okay, and then lift that up. Get up under that pelvic bone. That's the only part that you really end up kind of cutting through some of the muscle instead of following the the sinew lines. We got the thing hung up so high now I can't really reach it. Before it was too low. I think I did get my finger there a little bit. Mm -mm. <laughs> Throw it in the throw it in the cooler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Is this is this is your right. finger? That's right. <laughs> What's that from? Um, Robin Hood, with Kevin Costner. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Is this your finger? <laughs> <laughs> Just cut it up for a, as a hot dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I said, those calves will leave right on there, and then what I'll do is when we cut this thing down, I'll disarticulate these joints right here exactly the same way we, we did the front we'll just bend the joint backwards and i'll save these and we'll work that out just another day in a different video but here's our last piece of good meat and uh we definitely were as hardcore on the homesteading side of things we'd probably save all of these bones and render them down to stock and all that but boy, we run through a lot of animals and it's so hard keeping the business running at 110 mile an hour. We don't have time to boil all of that stuff down. It'd be nice to, but whew. All right, guys, so we knocked basically all the, uh, the major meat groups off of it, like I said, except for the calves, because I'm gonna knock these joints off in a second, the same way we did the, the front legs. And I'll put those in the freezer, and at some point I'll show you kind of pulling these apart and zipping down the legs and taking the sinew out, all this sinew bundle you can use for stuff. They said there's a little bit of meat here, but it's a couple tablespoons worth of meat compared to this thing's just so packed with sinew. I would rather keep the sinew than the meat, quite honestly. So uh, if we were really big into the homestead scene or whatever, kind of like, uh, you know, Mark and Allison at, at Omnivore's Homestead, they would cut all this apart and then, you know, boil it down, make a stock out of it, all that kind of stuff. And uh, you can certainly do that. We're, we're, we're crazy busy with all kinds of other things so we typically don't take it that far but if you want to watch that stuff you should go over and check out their channel and uh because they'll they'll probably walk you through doing a lot of that stuff but we got all the uh all the back strap i mean that's a lot of meat right there the front shoulders the hinds we got the uh the inner tenderloins out of it and because again we didn't save the organs because it was hit with a car and it's kind of starting to get a little bit funky it's a little bit septic in there probably best to just leave those alone uh, but other than that, like I said, we're going to keep legs in sinew, and after that we're ready to go. I'm going to cut the hide off and start kind of washing that out a little bit so we can save that for a future project. Lots of, lots of stuff that we put to use on a deer like this. So the whole thing with the same 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 blade I did the uh, that was on one of the one of the same blades that, was, uh, that we used with the bison, same thing, used it on a deer. 
and never had to sharpen it once but now that it's all said and done we could still work but i would rather go ahead take one row of flakes off of it sharpen it up it'll be ready for the new one minimal minimal uh material lost on the blade with just a, a couple little pressure flakes to sharpen it up and get a lot more uses out of it so make sure you check those out there at huntprimitive.com